Hey, thought it about time to do another restoration of an old bit of test equipment because um, I don't do enough of those. But uh, this one is a nice brand, Tektronics. Some of you may have guessed what this might be from the size or by looking in the, uh, <laughs> the video description or the title of the video. It's a tiny baby scope. Tektronix 224 Digital Storage Oscilloscope. Little tiny thing, you can see with the size of my hand, there's a whole range of these, uh, in the, I guess you call it the 200 series or something, our little baby scopes. I've got another one which I'm going to re restore in a later video as well, a different number. This one actually belongs to my brother and um, I was uh, given it temporarily to uh, fix it and uh, restore it and get it back into full working condition. It does turn on but there is a small problem which um, I will show you in a, in a moment. So if we pull it out of the bag, that's it there. Nice handheld size, a bit larger than pocket size, but it's not um, too bad at all. I guess it weighs, I don't know, two kilo, two and a half kilo, something like that. It has been calibrated once in its life at least. Traceable calibration, 3rd of December 1998. So it's a little bit Oh yeah, here we go, due date, 3rd of December 1999, so it's a, a little bit out of date, um, what's that, <laughs> 20 years, not too far anyway, and I think that would be the receipt, don't need that, in the side pocket here we have the power supply, these are, actually have an inbuilt battery, but I think the battery is not going to be too, um, too powerful, too, uh, in too much good condition. Uh, this quite obviously is not the original. <laughs> you can see the connector there. Yeah. We might do something about that. Alright, so. Power input at the back. It has a bit of a, a range. So that should be alright. And. Alright, there we go. We got something on the screen there. Yeah, you can see it on the screen there. The um, the trace isn't blanking properly. So what's happening is with all the characters along the bottom and the top, you can see there's like these lines connecting everything. The uh, the trace isn't turning off properly between the. Uh, if I can move move that cursor around a bit. So it seems to be working mostly. But yeah, we've got to figure out what's going on there. Okay, so it looks like we've got four screws on the bottom, and yep, another one under there, so we've got five screws on the bottom. There's a strap on the side which I think will come out when we take it apart, because the uh, the loop has got a split in the middle where the, uh, the case splits open. And there's this bag on the side which appears to be attached with the scope leads. And it looks like the scope leads plug in there. Ah, oh, that comes off. There we go. So that comes off there. There's our battery, which is two sealed lead acids. How does that come out? Does that just pull out? Yep. That wasn't even connected, actually. That was uh, disconnected. So we'll replace those. Maybe we'll get some uh, lead acid batteries to replace it, or we might see what we can do about upgrading it to a different type of battery. Hmm. Not sure yet. 8 volts, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2, 2, 4, maybe they've got 2 cells per battery, because with lead acid, um, each cell is 2 volts, so it might be 1 cell, 2 cell, 3 cell, 4 cell for 8 volts, or they could be wired in parallel with 4 cells per battery, good question, but I'm sure we can find some information about that online, and um, we can uh, follow in someone else's footsteps, and uh, fix that up. So there's no screws in there. So let's just undo the screws we can see and see what happens. One, two. Now these three screws are slightly different, or a lot different actually. They're real long ones. So the three screws in the blue section long and the two screws on the uh, the front face 
are short. Now will that come apart? Yes, it's coming apart. Maybe the front face has to come off. Maybe these knobs have to come off. But Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, so these knobs look like they're little rubber caps on top of a metal, a metal piece. You can see the uh, the Allen screw in there, and this little rubber bit just goes on the top. So I'll grab my Allen keys, and let's get these off. Too big. Alrighty, now let's see what happens. Yep, that's come straight off. It looks like they've actually slotted the holes so that when it goes on and off, you see this? See the slot is below? If I've got to lift that up, you see it gives it clearance to be able to come straight off. So that's nice. And the rubber insert for the uh, buttons will give that a clean up as well. And now this lid. Da, 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 da. All nicely shielded in there with some metallic sort of paint there. You got the uh, little pad thing there, the, the foam with the metal kind of mesh stuff on it. You find that in laptops a lot to make contact. And that is what we got. Cool little tube there. Looks like the high voltage stuff is all in this, uh, this kind of package, this plastic case, circuit board just poking out the end there, supply voltage is up to 1.6 kilovolts, so don't poke it while it's turned on, oh I just found the intensity, there it is on the back, I was looking for that before, oh I'll find it now, alright so, tube, We'll carefully put that aside and look for more screws or clips. That almost looks like it unplugs, but I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. How does that connect? Oh, okay, it's got edge connectors. Okay, so there's a battery there or a uh, super cap. There's no capacitors on that board. Just some stuff to clean up, bit of dust. There is a few capacitors here and there. Oh. 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 This is just falling apart. So all of those connectors. Um, yeah, okay. That's not so ideal that whole connector has just come apart ha huh. I'm going to have to trace that out and put it back together maybe put a drop of super glue on it to keep it in one piece but we've got to get this thing out somehow um wonder if these unplug yes they do okay so that's our input jacks gone that unplugs that way so this has got to come up and I'm sure that if I had the uh, manual it would be much easier I'm going to flick that little piece out. Where's my screwdriver? There. Now let's see what happens. Oh. That's come out now. Yeah, you can see this thing. Fell out of the back of here. That should have been clipped on. But it's come out. 
and all of these all of these it came off oh, it's kind of in a pattern so I'm not going to touch that yet but we've got two capacitors there three I oh know they're inductors got two capacitors there what, what brand are they Nichicon and I don't know I can't see Sprague Sprague one microfarad 200 volt and uh, 100 microfarad 35 volt I could probably replace those with the exact same brand Sprague still make uh, axial capacitors maybe they'll still make them in that type oh this uh, pot is a little bit loose that might need to have a bit of love uh, maybe, maybe that's just how it is but uh, it's a little bit bent you can see there it's a little bit bent this way that's the um, the intensity because it's got this rubber piece on the end and to turn it you put your finger on and then turn it so the force of being pushed has uh, kind of made it a little bit loose I'll leave that on there for now and then this piece ah oh, there we go we got it one capacitor that's a United Chemicon 1000 microfarad 35 volt SME series which is 85 degree SME I think that's just 85 degrees yeah it is 85 degrees standard general purpose capacitor that'll be like a power line filtering or bulk capacitance or something now let's open this up and see what we have here Oof. input hybrids we'll be careful with that I'm not going to go touching that too much there is basically nothing in there which I can really do anything with um, I could do stuff with some of the surface mount gear but I'm not going to go poking that too much actually um, these hybrid chips no 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 that's beyond my pay grade let's just get a bit of a close-up look of it Are these are uh, ferrites or something in the middle there coming through the board inductors yeah it looks like you got traces in rings around them they're like little transformers or something through the board PCB transformers interesting you got input one and two is a dual trace so that's all doing the magic nice so let's put that back together before we let all the magic out okay so it's all looking pretty good there's nothing that I can see that's obviously bad passes a sniff test nothing's burnt out nothing obviously cracked I got all the uh, calibration pots here well the um, for the uh, where the picture is on the screen you got horizontal vertical horizontal gain vertical gain vertical position horizontal position and astigmatism so we can uh, adjust that if need be but none of that was the problem it all was in the right positions it's just showing the uh, the line in between where it's tracing around drawing stuff so hmm nothing's burnt on that board I'm prob I'm leaning towards it being on this board all right so I thought I'd give these things a measurement or a test on the uh, ESR meter here I made this thing ages ago the ESR meter mark 2 from silicon chip magazine and um, see what these things come out at see if they're worth replacing so I'll turn the thing on and I'll zero out the leads this is really a bit dim so I'm going to turn off all the lights just so we can see the uh, the screen here so first of all we'll test this one microfarad capacitor see what that comes to 
And uh, on the front here is a um, like a guide to a basic uh, typical reading. So if we go one microfarad across to, this is a 200 volt, so it's going to be between 160 and 200, which is between 10 and 20, about, I guess, 14 ohms. And we're getting 11 ohms, so that's pretty good. That's uh, reading a bit lower than the typical according to this, so that's good. And I, I have already tested these, um, their capacitance, and this is spot on one microfarad. So this capacitor is actually pretty good. We could feasibly put that back in if we wanted to, and it will work fine. Well, theoretically work fine. So this one here is the uh, 100 microfarad, 35 volts. So if we got 100 microfarad across to 35 volts, we should see 0 0.5 ohms. So let's hook that up. 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.1, 1 .1. that should be 0. Point, was it 0. 0.5, um, that's like over 50% more than what it really should be, so that's reading a bit high, that ESR is not so good. I tested this on the, um, the uh, multimeter as well, the uh, capacitance, it should be 100 microfarad, and it's reading 68 microfarad, so it's down by like 30% as well. This is a 20% uh, tolerance, so that's out of tolerance, so that one needs to be replaced for sure. And this one here is the uh, 100, no sorry, the 1000 microfarad, 35 volts, so we go 1000 microfarad across to 35 volt, 0 0.04 ohms it should be, so let's give that a go. 0.12, that's, uh, that's, yeah, like, what, nearly 70%, 70% um, high, so that's, uh, that's not good either, and I, I measured this uh, on the, uh, the modern media, the capacitance, and it's reading 900 microfarad, so that's only 10% low, so that, the capacitance is good, but the ESR, nah, no good, so two of those need to be replaced, and I'm just going to replace all three anyway, because, you know, one capacitor extra on the the bill to repair this thing. Now, may as well do it while we got it out. That way we know it's going to be good. There's not going to be any other little problems coming up from this thing, potentially in the future. Okay, so I've got all the new capacitors in. You can see one there, and one just there. And we got the uh, the big one, the big capacitor just sitting there. So that's all done. Um, I put it back together, turned on, still got the same problem, so it wasn't the capacitors, I, I wasn't really thinking it was going to be, but I was hoping, wishing upon a star that that would fix it, but it didn't. So I've managed to find schematics of this thing. Well, it's actually the schematics for the 222A, whereas this is the 224, but it will be close enough. So I've uh, found the schematics for the Z amplifier and the Z circuit. That's the brightness of the screen because you've got X and Y, which is up and down and left and right. And Z is kind of like the third dimension, which is on a CRT, is the brightness. So because the, the trace isn't turning off, we're seeing all the lines everywhere. So I've got the, uh, the Z circuitry highlighted here. So first we'll look at this part of it, because this is a simple part. We've got this uh, chip here, which is the uh, looks like to be one of the main, C or the main CPU, or one of the main CPUs, something like that. It's the big chip anyway. U251 it is, and if we look at the uh, circuit board layout and uh, compare it there, there it is there, the big one in the middle. So I guess that's probably the CPU. And then pin 27 is the Z output, and it goes through CR252, which turns out to be a um, 40 volt 1 amp shock key diode, and then it goes around through a whole heap of stuff, not through anything of interest, just the schematics are drawn in such a way that it jumps through about four different pages, and then it leaves this board, and then comes straight into here. So there's a basically a direct connection from just there to here, and that's on the next board, which we'll look up look at it in a sec. So CR252 is a Schottky diode. So a Schottky diode is um, a diode that has a very small uh, voltage drop across it. A normal silicon diode has about 0.7-ish, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volt drop. Uh, a germanium diode has, what is it, about 0.4 I think? And a Schottky diode has as low as 0.15 volt. So it's a very low voltage drop. And that diode is located, CR252, which is that one right there. 
And that diode, um, the part number, I don't remember it offhand, but it is still available. I can get that um, diode from DigiKey for like 30 or 40 cents in quantity one. So if that's faulty, I will be able to replace it. So let's give it a test. We'll turn my multimeter up to uh, diode test. We'll hit the blue button. So if we've got a short, we should hear a beep. If we don't, we should get a number, and that should be the voltage drop. So if I hook that up like that, one way, we got nothing. That's good, because that means it's not conducting in one direction. And the other direction, we get a beep, and it says 1.154, which is pretty much spot on. So that diode is correct. That doesn't need to be replaced. That's working okay. So it wasn't the easy thing. I was hoping if that diode was bad, we could just replace it and... Uh, We'll get it working but we can't so that board is fine we'll put that to the side and then we've got this here so this is an amplifier so we've got the signal comes in we've got a few uh, diodes it looks like almost like a uh, a uh, voltage divider or some sort of rigmarole there comes in through a transistor through another transistor we've got a few little diodes here uh, possibly steering diodes or something, I'm not sure. Um, 0.1 mic capacitor and it comes down across straight into the CRT. We've also got the intensity control and that comes across and um, joins in here. So we'll have a look at this here. The most likely thing would be either the diodes or even more common would be the, for, to fail, would be the two tra one of the two transistors. Um, Usually the, the resistors don't fail unless you actually see scorching or burn marks on the board. So the board looks nice and clean. It's this board here with the CRT there. It's on this board somewhere. Um, I haven't had a closer look yet. But actually let's have a look now. Q, oh, is it Q407 and Q405. So we've got to find Q407 and Q4. Oh, there we, they are. Down here there's two little... Uh, tiny SMD, just those ones there, one and two there. So we can give those a test, and uh, it looks like, uh, where's a diode, CR408, CR408 is that big one there, so we've got a, um, another Shockey diode, which will probably be the same as the other board, just at the end of my finger, that big black dot there so we can give that a test and a few other bits and pieces so it looks like it's around this the wire where it comes out to the um, CRT this bit here is this gray one it's a shielded wire so it's all around in this sort of part of the circuit that we're looking so um, I'll give that a bit of a test see what I can find and if I find anything we'll be back to have a look at what we're going to do about replacing it Alright, so after a quick test, the transistors aren't shorted, the diodes around the place aren't shorted or open circuit. There seems to be uh, testing somewhat okay without pulling them out and testing them individually. Um, also, there's a 120 volt supply coming in. So if we test that, uh, it comes in, we'll go for a ground there, and it comes in over here. So we had 116.4 volts, so that's not too bad, that's pretty close. Enough that it shouldn't be a problem, like 3.5 volts shouldn't be a problem. There's also a 5 volt there, but I've got to find where that is, because it's a bit hard to read what resistor that is. R47, I'm not sure if that's a 9, might be R479. Uh, I'm going to find it here. So I can test the 5 volts then. From there, I'm not sure what else to look at. The uh, CR409, this resistor, he oh sorry, diode here, tests okay. I'll just test that before as well. And the intensity does work correctly. So this part of the circuit is working correctly, from what I can tell. Um, as I dial the t intensity up and down, the uh, intensity on the CRT does go up and down correctly. So it's definitely something to do with the Z amplifier I think hmm I'll continue searching 
All right, so I found where I can measure the 5 volts. Um, there's a plug right down in there, right in there, and there's two 5-volt uh, rails. So if I grab a ground from over here, and then I'll probe down in there. 5.1, it's a, counting from the right, it's a second and third pin on the rightmost connector. So I've got 5.1. Four point nine nine, basically spot on. Five volts and five volts. So the voltages are okay. So it must be. It must be something around here. There must be something going on. I have to have a closer look at this bit. All right, I think I've got this all figured out. I think I know what the problem is. Um, I apologise for the lack of video in this section. I somehow lost this video, but it was a little bit boring anyway. I was just me muttering to myself, poking at things with an oscilloscope. But we'll use the. Uh, the schematic, this is the best schematic I can get, uh, sorry for the uh, ratty quality, but um, we'll push through. Um, so I'll throw up some uh, some screenshots from the scope as I explain what's going on here. So um, first of all, uh, at the base of Q407, the transistor there, uh, you can see the, the waveform there is uh, nice and square. That's coming directly from the CPU through those uh, shocky diodes that we um, tested as good. So um, that's a nice signal that we're getting there. Not a problem at all. Um, the, the little bits of ripple you see there, that's inconsequential. That's not a problem at all. So if we move over to the other side of that uh, Q407 to its uh, collector, which connects directly to the base of uh, Q405, you can see now that um, something's looking a bit funny. Now, it's supposed to be upside down. That's what that, this circuit does. It, it flips that waveform upside down. But it's uh, not looking right. It's a all thin and pointy and not nice and square anymore. It's got those slopes on this right hand side there. The, the transistor isn't working right. So uh, that's already a suspect there, the Q407. Now if we move to the other side of Q405, we'll probe on the uh, the emitter of uh, Q405 there and you can see it's even looking, it's looking even worse. Barely there at all, it's just like little spikes here and there. Um, yeah, I think both those transistors need to be replaced. Uh, we should be getting an upside down version of uh, what was shown first, that first uh, screenshot, but we're getting <laughs> barely anything at all. There's nowhere near enough there to, to be driving the CRT properly. So then after that it goes through the, um, the DC blocking capacitor and whatnot straight down to the uh, CRT, but we're not getting much, so I'll, um, I'll replace those two transistors and uh, hopefully that brings it to life. So DigiKey have delivered, got the transistors and I got a new uh, backup capacitor here. I wasn't going to replace it, but then I had a, uh, a bad experience. Well, not a bad experience, but I, um, I did a repair on an Onkyo uh, AV receiver and amplifier where the uh, backup battery had leaked and done damage to the board. You said in an earlier one of my videos. Um, so I thought, ah, I may as well replace it. It's not expensive and uh, it means it's brand new, not going to leak, and it's a uh, known working part. So I've replaced the uh, transistors as well already and uh, the capacitor, of course. So this is ready to go back together and see if it's going to work. Okay, we got the thing back together, um, ready to give it a test. I've got the lights off so we can see the screen easily, and um, we're ready to power this thing on. It said beep, so that's a good sign. Wait for that screen to warm up. That's, that's looking pretty good. I'm not seeing any of those uh, lines that should have been blanked out. So it looks like those uh, two transistors was the key. One of them, or maybe both of them, at least one of them was bad. So um, now... Looks like it's going good. So let's bring up the uh, the test screen. Yep. There's no diagonal lines in there at all. That's nice and clean. The trace is nice. And it seems to be aligned pretty good. So let's clear that. I've got my other scope set up with the, um, the probe compensation, the square wave output. So let's see what channel 1 says. Yeah. That is good. All right, let's turn channel 1 off. Uh, turn it off, and channel 2, we'll turn that on, AC coupled, and what does that say? Also good, <laughs> nice, awesome, I don't have to open this thing up again, it's working good, that's fantastic, yep, perfect, looks like the blanking's working pretty good as well. So when I take when there's no signal, 
it goes blank. Put your finger on there, and it comes up. If I dial that, you'll see it's just some sort of distorted AC waveform. It's just picking me up like an antenna, or just the noise in the room. So that is a winner winner chicken dinner. Okay, the next step is the battery. I've decided we're going to go for a uh, lithium battery. Um, I could search and search in vain for uh, some 8 volt batteries to replace this if I wanted to go for the uh, lead acid. Uh, not really much point these days. Um, Mr. Carlson of Mr. Carlson's lab, he put in uh, some uh, nickel metal hydride. But I think I'm going to go for lithium because lithium has a good power density and uh, I want to build the circuit because it seems fun and um, it means I can easily swap those uh, 18650s in and out as I need to in the future. Whereas if I make a battery pack from nickel metal hydride, um, when they die, I'm going to have to make a whole new battery pack, custom battery pack. Whereas the lithium battery is a bit more work up front, but in the long run, it's just a matter of popping out standard batteries, popping new standard batteries back in when they die. So that, I think, is the answer. Lithium. Time to figure out this battery. So uh, there's a few different options. Uh, one option is try and find some new uh, sealed lead acid batteries, SLAs, but that's pretty much a, a, a non-starter. Trying to find two little 4 volt uh, SLAs is going to be very, very, very difficult. And anything you find that's new old stock is going to be pretty much dead anyway because it's just you know too old. So that's no good. The other thing is, like, like I said before in the video, um, I could uh, put a whole heap of AA nickel metal hydrides in, some inner loops or some something that's low self-discharge, uh, just like Mr. Carlson of Mr. Carlson's lab did. But I thought, nah, I want something a bit more, bit more up to date, bit more elegant, a bit more fun to produce. So I had a look around the internet. I found uh, a website. There's a guy who goes by the online handle um, Kitsuna Denshi, which is uh, Japanese for electric fox. Kitsuna is fox, and uh, Denshi is electric. Whereas uh, Denki is uh, electric, so as in electronics. So uh, Kitsuna Denshi, electric fox. So um, he's actually designed a, a circuit board. I've got a few made up. Uh, he's got all the files on his website. Link down below. It's uh, www.kitsune-denshi.net. Um, he's got the uh, the Gerbers to get the files made. or Sorry, to get the boards made. He's also got uh, the dip trace files, which is good because I use dip trace as well. So I was able to... Um, Stick that into the uh, dip trace, my uh, copy of dip trace, and um, play around with the uh, the layout. I didn't do any changes, but I might uh, have a little bit of a play if I do this again, just just for the fun of it. But um, yeah, I've got these circuit boards made, nice boards, nice design, thumbs up, and uh, then I hit uh, DigiKey and a few other places to get all the parts, and I ended up with this. That is a completed circuit. As um, as specified by uh, Kitsune Denshi. Now there's a few parts that are getting hard to get just because yeah, this was designed what, September 2017. Uh, three batteries there, just 18650s. I've written on them there the uh, the capacity. I tested them with the uh, the lithium battery charger I use for like remote control cars and my airsoft and stuff. And uh, they come up to about 2300 um, milliamp hours. So that's uh, about what? 7,000 milliamp hour, so that's not too bad. But the thing is, there's a little bit of a calculation you got to do because we're not getting 7,000 milliamp hours out of this thing. The reason for that is because we're boosting it up to eight volts, and uh, when you change the voltage, you change the milliamp hours. It's there's a little bit of a calculation to do. I'll put that on screen right now so you can see what it is. Turns out that this thing will run for about four hours on, um, well, calculated to be four hours on um, these batteries. Uh, on the original lead acids, the uh, manual says three hours. So we've got another hour of runtime with the uh, the newer tech. Uh, so that's um, all ready to go. Uh, on the uh, the website, Kitsune Denshi's website, he's got a uh, plans for a laser cut case. Um, I don't have a laser cutter, but I do have a 3D printer. So uh, I made a 3D printed case. Look at that. Pretty nice. Just out of PLA printed there. You'll find the links to this down below once again. Um, I've got the lid as well. So what I've done here, if you look at the, uh, on his website, you'll see his case has got some like plastic inserts for the uh, the LEDs. There's three LEDs. There's a uh, power LED, a charge LED, and a fault LED. And uh, with mine, I've just used little bits of acrylic rod. 
Um, here it is here. Three mil, about a little bit more than three mil. Got it from a Kihabara. And I've just snapped that into little pieces and filed the ends flat. Stuck it in and I've got my little light pipes. So I'll show you those lit up in a sec. Uh, I'll put a little bit of heat shrink on the outside. Just here just to, just to try and stop light bleed so they you get green is green, amber is amber and red is red. You don't get bleed across um, confusing the matter. So that becomes our battery pack. So basically what we do, we stick that in there, just like that. Lid goes on, four screws. Of course we've got to put the uh, power wire in. Let's assemble it, see how it goes. So we put that there like that. That clips on. I'll just get these things organized. And I need a screwdriver. I'm using um, M2.6 screws, uh, countersunk screws. They're about 10 mil long or so. M3 was a little bit too big for the amount of space, but M2, M2.6 is perfect, as you can see. So we'll stick the last screw in, just like that, and that, oh yeah, like a finger in a bum, nice, tight, but not too tight, perfectly sized, just like that, look at that, nice, and let's turn the lights off, alright, so we've got no no wires, running completely wireless. What happens when we press the on button? Give it a sec. Oh yeah, it's working. Look at that. That is awesome. Working well. Battery power. Perfect. Now, these LEDs, I'll show you those. So I'll turn this off now. It, when you plug it in, uh, here's my wire, charging wire. The green light will come on when there's power applied. As you can see there, and the amber comes on when it's uh, charging. So that amber light will go out once it's fully charged. And then if there's a fault in the battery, inside the battery pack somewhere, uh, and the, uh, the, I think it's the charger will detect that if they overheat or they go out of range with the, um, the voltage is too high or too low or whatever causes the fault condition, it will illuminate the red LED to let you know there's something wrong. So that is working great. There it is, all finished. Nice three printed case, screwed in nicely, all connected there to the original connector. Uh, label on the top, power charge and fault, so I know what the LEDs are doing. Tells me what it is or anyone else in the future, lithium-ion battery pack, input 8 to 10 volts, I think it can go higher for the input, maybe, um, I'm, I haven't tested it, uh, I've only built one of these, so I don't want to go too high, but this uh, outputs 9.5 volts when it's trying to charge, so um, 8 to 10 volts is a good number, output is 8 volts, uh, this thing pulls 550 milliamps, um, so I've written there at 0.6 amps, 1 amp max, the chip inside there, the uh, boost converter is good for 1 amp, and it's got three 18650 cells. So that's all good. So if we put the side back on, and I'll plug in our uh, leads. So pink for number one, I guess. That sounds good. Green for number two. And I'll turn off the lights so we can see the screen easier. And just double check it's still working on the, uh, I'll use the uh, compensation, the pro compensation on my other scope. Oh, if I can get a good contact. Yeah, there we go. Channel 1's looking good. And how about channel 2? I'll get the uh, trigger on the right channel. Looking good. That is fantastic. So that is done. We are completely finished. 
working great. Two thumbs up, one thumb up for me for fixing the thing and building that circuit and one thumb up for Kitsune Denshi for designing the circuit so that I could actually fix it. So uh, yeah, check out his site. Uh, it's got some good information there and if you have one of these, that circuit definitely works. I've, I've just shown you it working. So um, yeah, it's a good one. Alright, that's all we got for this video. Uh, as usual, hit that subscribe button if you feel like it. Keep watching the videos. We'll see you next time.